What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Brojo Online. Very special episode today. Today is the 200th official Brojo Online episode, uh, which is pretty fucking epic. I did not think that we'd make it this far. Or did I? I don't know. I guess I didn't really think about it at all. But here we are. 200 seems like a lot. Uh, and I put it to the Brojo audience, like, what should I talk about today? Lots of great ideas that I'm going to use all of them at some point. But one was pretty simple. How am I different? What's changed? My perspectives, my beliefs. And at first I kind of overlooked that one as a topic, so I thought, oh, I think I'm pretty much the same. I've locked in my philosophy, etc. But then I started listing out, like, the differences between when I first started this coaching business and now sort of a six or seven year difference and i'm like two different fucking people the the differences are massive not just in my life the outward manifestation of my life but the beliefs behind it the reasons behind those changes so that's what i'm gonna do this one's really for the fans i guess because if you don't know who i am you're not going to give a fuck about how i've changed uh because it's going to be of zero interest to you but if you've been following this podcast for a while, and some of you have been there since episode one, you might find it interesting to see how I've changed my views and my beliefs and my behavior and my lifestyle. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to rant about myself as if that isn't my favorite thing in the world to do. Okay. So <clears throat> let's start with a kind of before and after picture a snapshot to begin with and then i'm going to break down all those differences as we go through who i was okay when i first started this coaching business right at the beginning working 70 to 90 hours a week i was grinding hard like hustling like a motherfucker or at least i thought it was uh every day just all day every spare minute was spent working i just always had a laptop or a computer in front of me and i worked seven days a week kind of like six full days and maybe a half day on a sunday and i was just at it all the time all the time i was at it you know uh which stressed me out a lot i was quite burnt out and that was partly the reason why i also was smoking weed every single day you know um I don't know if addiction's the right word. I'm not entirely convinced that we can be officially, objectively addictive. But I could say I'm addicted or was addicted to dealing with my stress through substance use. Substance use. So that was definitely the case. So every day I smoked weed to deal with the stress, to to relieve myself of the burnout. Uh, I was single and not just single but dedicated to being single i decided that marriage and relationships but marriage in particular was for suckers it certainly wasn't for me didn't make any sense to be committed to one person for a long time you know biology we're not supposed to be monogamous etc 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 so i was really in that kind of mindset basically trying to fuck as many girls as i possibly could kind of attached to the numbers i wanted to impress myself i guess with seduction skills and so on um, but i was very much dedicated to independence i wanted to be able to call all the shots in my own life not have to consider anybody else's feelings at all and do whatever i wanted whenever i wanted to and i thought that was the best way to live um in terms of hobbies i was despite the fact that i was working such hours i was also like a dancerholic I'd gotten into salsa dancing, eventually that migrated into zook dancing. I'd be on like a dance team, uh, me and my partner would be working on a choreography for competitions, I'd be going to four or five classes per week. Sometimes I'd be in multiple teams, I'd be dancing six days a week, multiple hours per day, sometimes uh, up to 20 hours a week dancing. And when I wasn't doing that, I was playing in my band. I was in a heavy metal band for 20 years. And so I was still in the band back then. I'm no longer. Uh, my living situation, I was flatting. And uh, 
I can't remember exactly. Yeah, I was living in a house full of like tradies who just took drugs from Thursday to Sunday and partied hard all the time. And I, it's really hard for me to do my business because of the noise and the, just the traffic of people through the house. And it was quite an unpleasant experience for me to be living in that situation. Um, and yeah, I was always up until that moment in my life, I'd always been flatting and sharing my life with other people. So I was basically highly stressed from all of this. Um, socializing as much as I could kind of combining that with dancing, I socialized in the dance world. I was dating as much as I could. Uh, yeah, it was all about numbers. I wanted to have as many friends as possible and as many girls as possible. And I was kind of focused on that. And I, you know, it felt like kind of making up for my past. I missed out, especially on, on girls in the first 25 years of my life. And so I felt like I was kind of redeeming myself, you know, getting all those girls that I missed out on, that kind of thing. And the same with socializing. I'd been so socially anxious for most of my life, and now I was finally socially confident. I just felt like kind of throwing my weight around socially all the time, leading, starting groups, so on. Uh, just it was kind of like a thrill to finally have the balls to do what I wanted and say what well, speak my mind and so on so I was kind of socializing as much as possible to flex that that muscle uh, alongside weed use was binge eating so my eating was pretty fucking bad back then uh, I used to just go hard I actually got into a lot of financial problems for large part because I constantly bought Subway sandwiches. I'd get the foot long with the chicken and the bacon and usually three cookies and a big Coke and then have an ice cream later. You know, I, I ate like shit back then. Um, and it was a stress related thing. Plus it was this kind of whole mentality of I can do whatever the fuck I want whenever I want. And back then I thought, you know, freedom meant doing whatever you felt like doing all the time. So that's how I lived. And my finances reflected it. My finances were fucking wild. I got myself into huge debt in my first year of business, second year of business. And, uh, you know, I had the thing where I'm like looking at my bank accounts two or three times a day, hoping that I'm going to be able to pay rent, wondering how the fuck I'm going to keep this business going, eventually going into part-time work to keep myself alive, borrowing money, a lot of money that I'm still paying off. Um, I was just really bad with money. The funny thing is, I actually had enough income. I just was spending it way too much. And overall, I was super ambitious. I wanted to change the fucking world. I wanted to leave my mark. I was going to be the next something. The next Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, something. Sam Harris, fucking Marcus Aurelius. I had big dreams for myself and my impact that I was going to have on the world. I've always had a pretty big ego, even in my darkest days. But now that I was coaching and had my own business and was getting sort of positive results for people, now it was really like the fire was burning very brightly. I was going to make a mark. I was going to shift all 7 billion people of humanity in some significant way. And I had big dreams, TED Talks, all sorts of shit. So that's, that's where I was when this podcast first started. I mean, a lot of my philosophy is still the same, but when you hear to where I am now, how I am now, who I am now, you'll see there must have been some significant shifts. So let me give you the overview of where I am now, and then we're going to break down all these differences. So from 90-hour weeks, I'm now working 20 to 25 hours a week, uh, mostly focused on being a good father for my new daughter. And while that's a recent development, uh, the working 25 to 30 hours a week max has been happening for quite some time. I've really learned how to minimize my hours and maximize my output. We're going to talk a bit about that. But it's also about a shift in priorities. What matters? Uh, time versus value. People versus work. So on. I don't smoke weed at all. Well, maybe like two, three times a year now. I'll have like a weed day, just a more symbolic than anything else. It's just to remind myself that I can if I want to. That's what that's one of the things that really helps with overcoming addictions and bad habits is to 
do something that reminds you that this is not forced. That's always a choice. If you feel like it's forced, you're more likely to relapse. So that's about the only reason I still smoke weed. Uh, two or three times a year. I don't drink alcohol at all. I might have a beer at a wedding or something. But alcohol is completely absent from my life. And, you know, back in the day I was binge drinking on the weekends, tequila shots kind of lifestyle, you know. Now I don't drink at all. Um, one of the biggest developments is I'm happily married now, monogamously married. Have been for, well, I've been with her for almost six years, five or six years. And we're about to have our, Jesus Christ, I've lost track. First or second wedding anniversary. <laughs> I don't even know which one it is. <laughs> well, the fuck long have we been married? I think it's the first one. I don't know. No, it must be the second one because of COVID. Right. Guy brain, you know. Anyway, so that's coming up. Wedding anniversary of some amount of time. And, and I really do mean happily married, not like trying to convince myself that it's all good and secretly dying on the inside married, which is what I see a lot, but actually like, yeah, I prefer this. I choose this each day. Like I know I can leave. I could leave any time if I really wanted to, uh, even before Chloe or after. So yeah, I really am happily married. So there's been some big changes in beliefs there. Uh, I'm no longer dancing almost at all. It's partly due to COVID. Uh, probably would still be if, you know, we're allowed to like touch other people and shit. But I'm not playing in the band anymore. That's been defunct since I moved to Czech a few years ago. Um, and it was on the way out well before then. And that's quite a significant change because I saw myself as being a heavy metal musician for life, you know. And I no longer see that. And actually, I see it quite differently now. My current hobby is playing chess. That's probably a temporary thing. I go through these phases. I did magic for a while. I still play guitar for a while. I do random shit all the time. But now it's kind of like something competitive, something I can do at home. So uh, Obviously, I live on the other side of the world now. Um, that's a pretty big difference. I live in a country that primarily does not speak my language and... I'm really struggling to learn theirs, and the culture is significantly different. And rather than flatting and hanging out with people all the time, it's just me and my little family, and we're planning our first house. That's going to be happening soon. And socializing is minimal for me now, whereas I used to be like in contact with dozens of people, sometimes per day through not just coaching, but dancing and socializing, you know, hundreds of people a week I'd have contact with. Now it's really limited. Now it's like, you're hard put to get in touch with me now. I've got, I've got like a lot of barriers up to keep people out. I'll talk about why that is. I'm eating a lot better. Still got some work to do on that. That's kind of one of my final frontiers is getting my shit together with eating, but significant improvements. So I haven't just given up substances but i eat almost no dairy now i've cut way back on sugar i cook a lot of my own meals or at least i did until i had a kid getting back into that now uh and i'm really focused on heart health i have a genetic heart disease thing like i'm on cholesterol pills and stuff doesn't even matter how well i eat i'm, I'm always at risk um and you know five or six years ago was when i first got the warnings from the doctor like your cholesterol is actually high like you're gonna die if you don't sort of shit out but i didn't take it seriously back then or i didn't want to acknowledge it or something whereas now you know i'm really focused on saturated fats keeping them low and sugars low and trying to avoid dairy and stuff and generally pretty good with it Financially, I wouldn't call myself rich, but I'm definitely financially sound, and I do consider myself to be financially free, like I don't have to think about money, I don't have to worry about it. I have investments that are doing quite well. Um, I've even invested in a little bit of crypto just to see what the fuck happens. Um, but mostly sort of safe, sensible investing. And, you know, got an emergency account saved up, got... 
my money sorted, my spending never exceeds my income, and so on and so forth. We're able to afford to travel whenever we want and buy all the things we need without actually having to use much money, and so on. So, really got finances sorted, and I'll talk a bit about how that occurred. Um, but that was probably one of the biggest shifts. Like, you look at me six, seven years ago, I'm like a guy who doesn't know how to handle money at all. And now, I think it's fair to say I handle money exceptionally well. And I think one of the biggest changes, which I'll talk about right at the end, is I've given up on changing the world. <laughs> I'm not ambitious anymore. Uh, my focus is much more on valued living, it's much more centric, self-centric focus. Rather than trying to change the world, I'm just trying to manage myself. And uh, yeah, that's been a huge shift. My big dreams of my name being etched in concrete statues of me, people going, thank God. For Dan, without him, society would be a fucking mess. I've given up on all that. I've let it all go. And now it's just like, okay, just be honest, be respectful, take responsibility. A little minute focus on me and my behavior, and that's about it. So that's your before and after picture. And you can see why maybe, uh, you can maybe see why I wanted to do this topic. Because when I laid it out like that, those differences, I was like, fuck, that's a big difference. Like, that's two different people. I feel like the same guy, kind of philosophically. Uh, my views on the world and my perspective largely has remained unchanged. Like, if you listen to my earliest podcast, I'm not going to sound bizarrely different to how I do now. And there's stuff that I, content I made years ago that I think is still exactly how I feel about things now. But I guess my view of myself, who I am and how I should live is probably what's changed the most. So now I'm going to go through each of those and give you some insight as to why they've changed and how they've changed. Do a little sip. Tell you what, this, this bottle here, you know, five years ago, I would have actually had Coke in it every time. Now it's just got water tap water of all things okay let's start with less work so like i said i moved to like 90 hours down to 25 and there's a few reasons for that one is just the wisdom that comes from time served but i've seen a lot of people who do well in business over the years still maintain a massive grind workload like even when they're doing well the hours don't come down so that's a mentality thing that's not a needs based thing they don't have to do that they choose to or they can't help themselves but one of the biggest shifts for me was coaching and training and mentoring i got in business that helped me understand essentially the application of the pareto principle the 80 20 principle it's sometimes called which is if you really carefully measure what you're doing you'll see that most of what you're getting results wise is coming from a small amount of the work you're doing and that most of the work you're doing doesn't really contribute shit it's valueless it's worthless and you can see this uh, it's not just for business owners uh, entrepreneurs you can see this actually the studies were done for people who are employees it was kind of a self-report study uh, i can't remember who did it you can look it up and they found that of an eight hour day employees are really productive for about 2.5 to 4 of those hours and the others are just a waste of time essentially you know tasks like fucking around checking emails without any purpose so on and so forth they actually takes up a majority of most people's days the kind of the activity they do that's very valuable to the company is only a couple of hours a day uh and i finally you know once i started building up a client base it was actually helpful to use money as a guidance tool where I actually figured out where does my money come from? What is the activities I do that leads to money in my bank account? It leads to clients served valuably so that they want to continue working with me. What is that actually made out of? And I started, I've got this epic spreadsheet that I update every quarter. And it tracks a few things. One is it tracks how somebody found me or how I found them. It tracks like how our interactions began, you know, what started things off, how did the relationship start. 
and sort of key factors like what were the things i did that really transformed them from just a person into a client like what kind of acts of service did i do that was really powerful for them and it also ranks them all the people i've worked with in terms of how much i enjoy working with them and how valuable they've been financially for me and i'm able to clearly categorize and see where all my money comes from and where all my satisfaction comes from as well which i think is equally important so i get down to this double factor of who pays me the most and i enjoy working with them the most who are these people it's kind of like cream that rise to the top don't get me wrong nearly all of my clients have been enjoyable to work with i've had some duds especially in the more so in the earlier years but i would, I would happily work with most of them again but there are some who are just amazing to work with. Like I look forward, I see their name on the calendar. I'm like, fuck yes, this guy fucking impresses me, you know? And that's most of my clientele now, uh, if not all of them, you know, I've really learned how to just work with the cream of the crop sort of thing. And what I found is I was doing this huge amount of work per day, 19 hours worth of work, but only about half an hour to an hour's of it, not including creating content or coaching sessions themselves, but the stuff that I was doing to build relationships, that was all that mattered. That was, that was where all my business came from. All this other noise that took up, I don't know how it took up so much time, you know, creating my website, Facebook posting and other social media, various things, wasting my time with, you know, answering big emails to people who weren't even really worth talking to, I guess, in terms of my business. There's lots of stuff eating up my time. Lots of, I was keeping myself very, very busy. And often so busy that I didn't have time to do the stuff that actually mattered. In fact, that might have been the reason I kept myself so busy is because the stuff that matters is uncomfortable. And this is really the secret to a business that I've now discovered and I've helped other people discover it. And when they apply it, it works for them too. There's about an hour's worth of work per day, almost any type of business that actually matters and it's generally building relationships and serving people very powerfully finding the right people and making their lives better solving their problems and it means you got to risk rejection and other kind of negative feedback like me creating my content is partly related to that a lot of my content is me making something for one specific individual to serve them and then just posting it publicly as well a lot of my podcasts are based on that. And then, of course, it creates a library where I can help people just by sending them links. You know, I've got a lot of people who take the piss out of how many links I send them. So basically, I discovered this quality approach. There's, I can make my business better by doing less, not more. And I could have done that from the start had I known. So that's one of the main reasons I work less now is it's simply more effective and more productive and more enjoyable uh i was just wasting time before and that's how most people run their businesses they do a lot of hours but very few of those hours are actually valuable also uh, bonnie weir uh, was a nurse who worked with dying people and she wrote a huge amount of work on regrets of the dying and one of the big shifts that's happened for me since i first put out my podcast is I've realized that quite often I intuitively understand that what somebody is saying makes sense and I should live by it. But I used to always have to go and make the same mistakes they did before I take them seriously. And this is how most people seem to live. Like they'll see even my stuff. They'll see a video and they agree with me, but then they'll go do the opposite anyway. Like they had to go the long, hard way to come around to understanding what I said. And I was like, okay, I don't want to be like that anymore. I, I've seen this happen so many times. I read something, look at something, I think that's great. I should do that. And then I go do something else instead, learn the hard way from lots of mistakes and eventually come to the same conclusion. The fucking person that I've read the first time. So one of the things I started looking at is, well, what do people regret when they die? You know, on their deathbed, what are they looking back and going, fuck, I should have done this and should have done that. And rather than waiting till I'm there to say the same thing they fucking said, when there's no chance of redemption, I was like, what if I make the change now? It's kind of like I made the change I'll talk about in a minute for my cholesterol. Like I'm taking my cholesterol seriously in my 30s, whereas most people wait till after their first heart attack. 
I'm like, why should I wait? I know where this is going. I don't have to make that same mistake and eat bacon and butter like all the other fucking idiots do and think that they're invincible. I'm not going to do that. Well, it's the same with regrets of the dying. One of the main regrets of the dying was not spending enough quality time with your loved ones and working too hard. And I'm like, I can change that right now. So I have. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to wait until my daughter goes, you don't know me. You are never there for me. I'm like, no, I'm just going to, I'm going to actually just be there for her. And I'm going to reduce my workload so that I can. I've actually passed up on many thousands of dollars worth of work this year. So I can be a good dad. Because I know that on the deathbed, I'm not going to be like, oh, I wish I had a few more grand. I'm going to be like, fuck, I hope my daughter's got a good connection with me. So that helped me realize what's important. You know, so it's a combination of priorities in life. Like, what what am I really going to be glad that I spent my time doing in the future? As well as being rewarding right now. And then leverage. You know, what's the minimum amount of action I can take for the maximum output? Which is, the I had to let go of my belief that being busy is good. That's the essential belief that changed there. Being busy is not good. Being lazy is good telling you if you're lazy if you're like okay how do i get the shit i need done in the least amount of time possible then you're on the right track if you're like how do i stay busy all the time and look productive and make people impressed with how much i've got and brag about how difficult my shit is now you're on the wrong track because it's not sustainable you know i was getting burned out i've got a history of burnouts and it's been a couple of years now since my last one my longest like time spent without burning out and i think it's because i finally found a sustainable way to live i can keep this going forever what i'm doing you know 20 hours a week whatever i could do this in my 80s and it gives me a nice broad range of life activities i'm not like all focused on one area and just getting thrashing it to death while everything else gets neglected i can keep going with what i'm doing now and that's the key sustainability and ultimately, I just realized that social pressure, we get to work hard, it's bullshit. It's fucking bullshit. Working hard is fucking stupid. It's stupid, right? I don't know why we don't know that. It's so miserable to work hard, isn't it? And I'm not saying that you shouldn't put in the effort. But the effort is about discomfort. It's not about time served. You know, it's more effort to do brave actions for an hour than it is to do mediocre actions for nine hours. Okay, that takes more effort, but it's less time. So if you're starting a business, yeah, you can grind for 10 hours and brag to all your mates, but you're probably just sitting behind a computer being nice and comfortable. That's your grind. Whereas you could go out for an hour, meeting with people and getting rejected and so on, and that'll do so much more for your business, and then you have the rest of the day off to recover and work on the other areas of your life because Ultimately, that's what you should be doing because you are your business. If this isn't taken care of, all the shit's going to fall down eventually anyway. Same with being a father or a friend. You know, you've got to take care of the, the product, right? Otherwise, it's, you know, it's a shitty product. It's always going to be mediocre. So that's why I work less, okay? And I look forward to working even less in the future. I want to get down to the point where I will have like, this is my dream is I have five sessions with clients per week. So one per weekday. And I create like some content, like I write a book or do videos and podcasts. I quite enjoy it. And that's it. 10 hours, maybe a week. That's what I want to get down to. And the rest is just leisure time. That's my big dream, you know, and I'm getting closer. It's exciting because I had a kid. So now I've got no free time, but, uh, yeah, I wasn't prepared for that. Next big change. The absolute absence of substances from my life. Let's check everything's still recording. Yep, we're all good. It was actually uh, my wife who prompted this. Uh, alcohol was my own decision, but weed, my wife, when we were talking about being together at the beginning, you know, we had a big conversation, like if we're going to be girlfriend and boyfriend, like what are the deal breakers? What are the boundaries? Let's get out in the open now, because if we're a bad fit, let's end it before it begins. So we had that big conversation, which by the way, if you haven't had yet with your partner, have it really have it as early as possible. It might break you up, but it won't do you any harm that isn't already going to happen. 
you know. Anyway. And uh, she had a big problem with with my weed smoking, just the quantity, you know, the daily use. And she didn't like being around me when I was stoned, which is fair enough because I was basically a different planet, you know, and I always get a bit uh, self-conscious talking to people when I'm stoned. Like I overthink what I'm saying. And so I can be a bit weird. Anyway, I'm also hilarious, but that's another thing. Uh, and I was kind of left with this thing, like, it wasn't quite a deal breaker for her, but sort of was. Like, she was really on the fence about whether or not she could accept that. And I went through a big uh, ego thing with this. I'm like, I don't have to give something up just because somebody else. I'm not going to compromise who I am, blah, blah, blah. And I had to ask myself, I'm like, is smoking weed a compromise? Like, is that who I am? Would giving it up be compromising my principles? And the question just came back with an immediate answer. It's like, no, smoking is compromising your principles. Your wife's asking, you know, well, no, she wasn't my wife at the time, but Lucy was asking me actually to do what was best for me, not what was best for her. I mean, that was her intention. That's what she wanted for herself. But essentially she's saying this is also what's best for you and you know it. And she was right. It took me a long time to swallow that bitter pill, which was, you know, I can make a big scene about how I'm a man. You can't tell me how to live. But ultimately she wasn't. My own values were. And it came down to actually kind of a quite a masculine challenge. Some voice in my head says, what, you can't face stress, you fucking pussy? You can't face your emotions like a fucking man? You know, you got to hide behind this shit. It's funny because masculinity, you know, I grew up thinking guys who took heaps of drugs and were hard and drank and all that, that that was masculinity. I'm like, no, it's fucking cowardice. <laughs> you know, they're the fucking pussies. They look hard. They can't even handle a bit of sadness or a bit of stress or a bit of anger. They have to fucking go to chemicals to like override their system. That's not hard. That's soft. That's fucking weak. And especially, you know, when I saw socializing and alcohol together, I'd already like, to be fair, by the time I started this podcast, I was already at the point where I could socialize sober without anxiety and was already questioning, like, why do I drink then? What's the point? Like, lose my whole weekend being hung over, spewing up, making a scene, not doing so well with girls once I get past a certain point, alcohol wise. So on, I already had some questions, some serious concerns, but I was surrounded by a culture of drinkers and I just went along with it. And then the other voice came up like, well, you drink because other people do, you fucking coward, you know, and I was getting some really challenging voices coming up from my subconscious. My values were talking to me. They were talking about how I was losing my life to hangovers and I was killing my health and losing my weekends, I couldn't manage my own anxiety and my own emotions, what I was doing didn't align with my values. And eventually I kind of got to this point like, why am I taking anything at all? Why can't I handle life without it? And I just, I, I kind of gentled down a little bit and eventually got to this point where I'm like, I just want to see if I can actually handle life on life's terms, you know, just with the chemical balance that I've got kind of thing. Um, actually, it's kind of a weird thing to say because food, coffee, they all act on you chemically as well. But the reasons particularly for weed and to a lesser extent alcohol weren't good reasons. I didn't have healthy reasons for using them. I think very few people do. So I was like, this is now about my values. Lucy was really just prompting me. I could choose between keeping the weed and not have the girl. And I was willing to make that kind of choice. But I was like, so I'm going to do something that compromises my values and miss out on possibly the best relationship I'm ever going to have in my life. Why? Why would I shoot myself in the foot in such a retarded way like that? So I decided, no, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to quit. And I did. And... It wasn't long, it was weeks maybe, before I realized, oh my god, I should have done this a long time ago. Like I said, I'll still have a beer at a wedding, I still smoke, I have like little weed days every now and then. Um, Lucy even is the one to prompt me, she's like, you should have a day, you know. Um, and all it does is serves to remind me why I don't do this anymore. Like, uh, after I do get 
like I don't get drunk anymore, but if I'll have like three or four beers kind of thing at a wedding, the next day I'm all acidic and slower and less cognitively capable. Same after weed, I'm just a bit like kind of lethargic and slow. I don't want to be like this. I want to be on form. I don't know which day is going to be the last day of my life. I don't want to spend it like, oh, fucking turn the, shut the shades, the sunlight. I want to be, you know, performing to my best right up to the finish line. So eventually it just it came down to acceptance, being able to tolerate the upsets of life without having to rely on some crutch, without being a fucking coward. I just hated to see myself as a pussy, you know? And also I had to face it like all that substance use was about control. I was trying to control my emotions or I was trying to control the rest of my life and burning out needing substances to recover from that desperate control of everything. So one of the major shifts for me was acceptance. I've done a whole podcast about that, so I won't go into it now. You can look it up. But I kind of finally figured out how to accept all the stressful, frustrating, shitty things in life. Not perfectly, but way better than I was. And I found that once I learned how to live with the value of acceptance, I just had no desire for mood-altering substances anymore. It sounds like I'm judgmental, maybe I am, but I'm, I don't feel that I am. I don't care if other people drink and use drugs and do whatever they want. Because life is hard, and fuck it, I'm not going to tell you how you're going to cope with it. Like you got to get through somehow. It's not up to me. This is just a decision I made for me. Uh, I don't care what other people do here, but I'm doing it for me, and it's, I'm glad that I did. Now, one of the biggest changes. I'm happily married. I thought I was missing out. You know, when I was so terrible with women from my teenage years through to my mid-twenties and I just found like there was some sort of fucking Rubik's Cube Da Vinci Code mystery that I could not crack. Didn't realize, of course, I was self-sabotaging, but it's a whole nother story. When I finally kind of got past that, you know, it started with the pickup artist stuff and I kind of got laid after four years without, and and, and I was like, holy shit, maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel, you know, and then I kind of got what you might call good with women, and I started to get to the point where I could go somewhere, I'm like, I'm definitely going to hook up, and you know, I, I just had that kind of confidence, and ideally became quite even more so outcome focused when it came to women. You know, I was just like, what's another vagina that I can add to my list of vaginas that I can claim? It got a bit like that. I was never really fully psychopathic about it. I still cared about people's feelings. I felt bad if I hurt girls, but I was hurting girls. You know, I'd sort of sleep with them and then afterwards realize they wanted more and just ghost them. And I, I had guilt about it, but I was still doing it. After a while, <laughs> this will sound pretty crude, a uh, flat man of mine said, they're all sisters upside down. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, what I came to realize, I'm like, you know, doing push-ups on top of somebody while being naked is pretty much the same no matter who that person is if you don't have a connection with them. It's just more physical. It's kind of like dancing, kind of like working out, ends with an orgasm. Most of the time you're so anxious about whether or not they're being pleasured that you're not really enjoying it that much yourself, as much as you claim to be and so on, or at least that's how I felt. I got to the point where I'm like, it actually feels like I'm trying really hard to get as much variety as possible to sleep with all these different people, and I'm not really sure why. Because I was getting to the point now where I could rack up those numbers, and it wasn't as rewarding as... I thought it would be and often I felt lethargic about it like I just don't want to I, I you know I missed a lot of opportunities I just couldn't be bothered and especially I think working on my coaching business helped me realize that like this importance I attached to sex before that was because I didn't have anything better to care about but when I started caring about helping people pleasers and building self-confidence and kind of solving the world's problems one person at a time, sex became just like a fun activity 
It's still good most of the time, but not always. In fact, way less often than people make out to be. Like, sex isn't that great a lot of the time. Uh, if you take away the sort of ego boost you get from it, if it's just talk about the physical activity, it's like, well, oh, it's all right, you know. It's like getting a nice massage or dancing. And I started to just become sort of less obsessed with it. I'm like, it's not that important for me to get my dick wet anymore. It doesn't have a huge amount of meaning or purpose attached to it. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And even physically, it's like okay, but not amazing. Sometimes it has been, but, you know, sometimes I still remember. But there's other times I'm just like, all right, so now it's time to chew my arm off like a coyote and jump out the bathroom window. Like, what was the point of that? And overall, a belief system was changing in my life where I started to realize that when I focus on depth rather than variety, my quality of life goes up. For example, if you commit to one style of nutrition and exercise rather than kind of picking and choosing little bits all the time and changing things up all the time, you get better results. If you commit, you know, uh, when I went all in on coaching rather than kind of jumping around jobs and trying lots of different things and just got deeper and kind of started to master something. Same with dancing, when I started to master it. I was like, this is so much more rewarding than doing lots of different things. In fact, there still is variety. The deeper you go, the more different things are. And just the last frontier for me was relationships. I was like, well, what if I did this socially? What if I went from like lots of people to a few high quality people? And then eventually from there, I went to what if I went from as many women as I could to one? And this was really hard for me to shift with. And actually, it wasn't really an internal decision. It was externally motivated when I met Lucy. I wasn't actually, I'd already gotten to the point where I'm like, I don't care if I never get married. I'm actually quite okay with that. I don't even understand why most people do because they clearly don't do it for good reasons and it doesn't go very well for them. Yeah, divorce rates are high for, you know, it's no surprise. But I was okay with, like, I'd actually made my peace. I didn't have any of that social pressure anymore. Like, I mean, it was there. Like, people were like, oh, when are you going to settle down? I'm like, I'm not. Shut up. You're a loser. I just didn't care. I had no guilt to satisfy anybody else anymore. And then I met her, you know. And I'd been dating at the time. And I'm going to be not humble here because I just need to be honest. I was doing quite well with women, shall we say. Uh, the quality of the women in my life, they were beautiful, they had great personalities, they were successful. I was kind of like, wow, this is like the elite of women that are coming into my life. I'm very, very lucky here. And then I met Lucy and she just blew them out of the water. And the, I don't, I can't explain why exactly. It's not even that she was the prettiest one or or anything like that. It was just... I just couldn't spend enough time with her, you know. I just wanted to see her all the time. When she talked, she surprised me with how interesting she was. She would say these spontaneous things. I'm like, what the fuck did you just say? Oh, my God. And nobody else surprised me. It's one of the downsides to studying psychology your whole life is people become pretty predictable. And, yeah, it's like I don't mind it, but sometimes I feel like almost... To be fair, I feel almost psychic. Like, I know what someone's going to say before they say it a huge percentage of the time. I know how they're going to react to stuff, even if I barely know them. It's just what happens when you dedicate your whole life to studying people. But Lucy, to this day, surprises me and intrigues me with the way her mind works and with what she says. And that's how she got me right at the start. I'm just like, I can't believe what this chick's saying all the time, you know? And a lot of the time, there's things where... I'd throw out very controversial opinions I have and so on. I, I, When I was dating, I used to do this thing called push them away with honesty. Like, I'm so honest with girls that like only someone who's a great fit for me can handle it. And I was doing that. Was, she was just some another girl I was experimenting this with. And it always drew us to click together. 
And that's what was really surprising. I'd, I'd say some very strong belief. And she's like, yeah, exactly. Because I think blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, holy shit, that's what I was thinking. And we just keep having moments like that. I'm not saying we agreed on everything. In fact, the disagreements were really even more intriguing. Anyway, it just, it wasn't a conscious decision. Like, okay, I'm going to spend, the, you know, some people say like, as soon as I saw her, I knew I'm going to spend the rest of my life with her. I don't, I don't even know if that's possible, but. I definitely didn't feel that. I just like, I've got to see this chick one more time. You know, like, how do I see her again? I can't stop thinking about her. I want to talk to her all the time. She's just so fascinating. Um, and that just developed and eventually got to the point where she said, well, it's us together exclusively or we can't continue. And that was a huge thing for me. I was like, oh, I'd already gone to the idea of like, if I was going to have a relationship, it would be an open relationship that I still had some vague attachment to being sexually free, you know? But again, when she raised it, I'm like, does it really matter? Do I, pref you know, if I had to choose between the ability to sleep with whoever I want, whenever I want kind of thing, or to be with her, what's more rewarding, what's better. And again, it was same, just like the weed. I'm like, I'm not sure this one even aligns with my values. I don't feel good about it. I can't think of a good reason to be doing it. I can think of plenty of insecure reasons driving it and no secure ones. Being with her makes way more sense. And so I had to take a big, it was, I had to take, think about this for quite a while. I was really struggling with the idea of it. And then eventually I was like, okay, all right, I'll give it a go. We made a kind of deal that even though we're committing to each other, there is no lifetime promise here. One person can leave any time they want to. We talked about that a lot, and that helped relieve a lot of the pressure for me uh, that I was putting on myself around freedom, which was a reminder that I am always free. And I've got to put this out there for every single one of you. You have always been free. You always are free. Nothing's changed it. It doesn't matter if you signed a contract. It doesn't matter if you committed and promised things. There's really nothing stopping you from changing your mind. So don't ever tell yourself that you're forced because that's a fucking lie. You choose everything you do, everything. Even if you're locked in a prison, you still choose how you behave in that prison. So for those of you saying, like, oh, I have to stay with my wife. No, you don't, actually. You could leave any second of any day. So if you aren't, that means you're choosing to stay. Own that shit. And that's what that kind of perspective is what changed me as I'm like, I'm actually still free in a relationship. I always thought that there was an absence of freedom. The thing is, it's actually more freedom because now I don't have to think about dating. Okay. I've got extra bandwidth now. My romantic sexual connection intimacy needs are fully met now. I don't have to put any effort into that. It just happens automatically every day and better than it ever has before so now that's one less thing on my plate you know now i don't have to think about that i can focus on fucking doing better shit with my life than trying to get laid so it really that was what got me into it and then the partnership thing was what i didn't see coming that really locked it down for me and led to me eventually proposing for marriage I'd always kind of secretly hoped to have a girl in my life who would be like my partner in crime. I actually had a vision at one point of me being on stage doing a TED talk and everybody loving what I'm saying. And then behind the curtain is this woman who's actually the reason I'm there. She's been the support and the encouragement and the driving, getting me through the hard times. I'd always kind of, you know, coveted that little fantasy of this kind of woman behind the man thing, you know? Um, but I, I, I consider it to be a fantasy and nothing more. I always thought if I was in a relationship, it would actually be the other way around. Like I'd be doing all the work and she'd be having all the glory. And then Lucy started supporting me. You know, she helped me get my finances in order so that my business sorted out. She helped me. I always, always worried that a relationship, a partner would try and draw me away from my work, but she always encouraged me into it, but more... Like she focused me like a sniper rifle, whereas before I was like a shotgun just spraying everywhere. She was like, you know, you know, getting me to do the things that matter most and the most important and work the best. She never held me back. She just focused me. And my business has 
improved by 20 or 30 percent every single year since i've been with her and that's largely because of her and it's now even to the point where she actually works with me she does a lot of the stuff that you see uh, she's doing a lot of behind scenes work design posting uh, admin everything so she really has become my partner in crime like I get to do the thing, my mission, the thing that I fucking care about better because of her. It's not that she, she's not a barrier to that. Like I always expected a relationship to be, she's honed it. I'm better at it because of her. Um, so the last thing really was marriage because I was like, okay, even being dedicated to a woman, staying with her for life, being monogamous, it's not the same as getting married. Marriage is this legal thing with religious overtones. Still not sure I'm on board with it. And it was a struggle for Lucy. She was just waiting for me to propose. She didn't want to nag me about it because culturally it's a big deal for her and she wanted to be married before she had a kid. You know, she had some values around that. And for me, I'm just like, uh, I don't know. I don't see marriage as this thing. And then eventually I came to realize I'm scared of getting married. I'm scared of making that level of commitment to someone of kind of like the commitment wasn't so much marriage, but it's what marriage represents for me, which is family. I was saying, I'm going to be in as the husband and the father, not like just some dude who can bail whenever he likes. I'm actually going to make a kind of commitment, not so much to them, but to myself. I'm saying I've, I'm signing up for this and whatever comes with it. And I can't just dine and dash. Like if things go wrong, I'm going to stick with it at least for a while to try and sort them out. And I, was, I realized I was scared of that. I was scared of kind of locking myself in like that. And eventually, as unromantic as it sounds, I came to realize that proposing for marriage was a huge opportunity to be brave. I had to face my fears wasn't just the fear of her saying no, it was the fear of her saying yes, you know. Because <laughs> I actually, uh, by the time I proposed, I had zero idea how she was going to react. I had no idea at all. Most, in the movies, it's always like the scene is this high risk thing. But in real life, when most people decide to get married, they've talked it to death already. It's not a surprise. They had no doubt that the person was going to say yes. In my case, I'm like, this is a coin toss. I, Because she had stopped talking about it. Uh, which I didn't realize she'd stop because she didn't want to nag me, but she was desperate for us to get married. It was at the point where I was like contributing severely to the depression that she was going through at the time. Uh, and so I thought she was actually, she might actually say no. But I thought, no, you know what? This has presented itself as something I'm scared of. And at that time, my value said, if I find something I'm very scared of, I have to do it. It's the value of courage. And so eventually it just came to a point like, I have to propose. I have to. I don't have to stay with her for the rest of my life. Marriage has never meant that for me. It still doesn't. There, If she changes in some significant way where I don't like being with her anymore, I'm not going to stay. It's as simple as that. And I wouldn't expect that of her either. I'll try and make it work for a while. That's the difference that marriage makes. You know, I had a friend explain it to me, like, sometimes you just won't love each other, but it's temporary, and marriage is like the bridge that gets you through that valley. You don't just fucking bail impulsively. You're like, okay, let's talk this through. Let's work at it. It's worth trying to, like, maintain the commitment. And then you might get through the valley and go, okay, that's actually not so bad. We just had a rough patch. So I understood that, and I still do. But I don't feel obliged to anything in my life. I don't have to stay here. It's all a choice. It's always a choice. Even now that I'm a father, I know that it is an option to bail. I can't see myself doing it. But it's important that I know that it's an option and that I have the option available so that I don't panic. Because when I feel like I'm not free and can't make decisions for myself, I panic. Um, but knowing that it's always a decision that like every time I wake up in bed next to my wife, I'm like, I choose to be here. The door is right there. I can grab my wallet and my passport and fuck off anytime I like. So if I'm not doing that, this is a choice. I am free. This is not a prison. It never was. And that helps me kind of go like, okay, maybe I don't need to panic. This is fine. It's actually way better than being single. So I'm going to stick with it. So that's changed a lot for me. 
And it's definitely one of the most significant ones. Uh, my best man at my wedding said, I can't remember his whole speech, but he said something along the lines of, you know, Dan was the guy that we assumed would never get married uh, and never wanted to. Moving on. A couple of quick points. So I won't go too deep into these ones, but uh, not dancing at the moment. Like I said, that's largely COVID related, but also I, since first podcast, I've come to a conclusion now of what you might call primary and secondary purpose. It's a framework that I encourage people to use, but it just, it works for me anyway, which is I have my primary purpose, which is the coaching and writing books and videos and podcasts. It's that putting that philosophy out there that helps people stop people pleasing and, and live a life that they can actually enjoy and be themselves, right? That's my primary purpose. That's my mission. That's the thing I'm like, this is what I'm here to do. Secondary purpose is something that is very meaningful, but you can chop and change. There's no obligation or commitment to it. It's just something that gives meaning to your life. You don't have to do well in it. It doesn't have to have an impact. It's just for you. It's just fun. It's just an enjoyment. Actually, one of the uh, topics proposed for this podcast was, you know, the value and benefit of having fun to explain that more. Well, this is a practical way to do it is you have your primary mission, which you know, I'm quite serious about mine. You can see it in my content. And if you work with me as a coaching client, like I take this shit very seriously. doesn't mean I'm not enjoying myself, but I'm not fucking around either. I'm here to like, you know, take names and whoop some ass kind of thing. Uh, but with my secondary purpose, I can do whatever the fuck I want. It's fleeting. I'm in a band and then I'm a dancer and then I'm a magician somehow. And then I got into drawing and art for a while, and now it's chess. It's something that's meaningful for me to do. It's artistic and creative. It's self-expression. But it's got none of the, like, seriousness to it. I don't have to do well. I don't have to be noticeable. I don't have to stick with it. I can be flaky. I can approach it any way I want. I don't have to follow the rules or the commonly accepted practices doesn't have to earn money and that's how I kind of keep fun in my life as I have this other thing very meaningful very much aligned with my values for example say dancing you got the values of connection you got taking care of your body even there's some courage things like performing on stage or doing choreography is the challenge of that there's the honesty as well there's a, it's hard to explain the the connection uh, physically where you kind of open yourself up to someone there's a leading and the following there's assertiveness and leadership there and then with chess you know there's sort of creativity there's competition there's uh you know keeping my brain healthy there's a lot of values playing in that too but it's still just fun like i don't have to do it well I, there's no rules about it i just do it as i see fit so that's why I'm, I'm actually okay to let go of something like playing a band for 20 years and then just not anymore. My, my guitar's collecting dust in the corner. I'm okay with that because I, I'm not going to force myself to do something because that's not meaningful. I have to want to do it. Let it draw me to it. Make I have to spontaneously go, let's go do this. Um, that being said, one of the great things about my wife is I have a laziness problem that can go too far. So it's good for reducing like pointless activity, but can go to the point where I could quite happily just sit on the couch, and watch Netflix all day long for the rest of my life. What Lucy does is help me get out of the house and do stuff, you know? So sometimes I have to be pushed to go dancing and then I enjoy it. But also like if I'm at a dance event and I'm like, you know, fuck, I've had enough. I'll just go home. I won't force myself to stay be like no you must fucking enjoy this no i don't have to it's my secondary purpose whereas coaching no matter what mood i am i show up to coach no matter how life's going i put out videos like it's not forced i won't say that but it's commitment you know it's it's a military level of commitment i'm like i'm in this this i'm in the war now i'm a soldier you know if i run away i get shot by my superiors i've got to do this i must uh, I don't have that with my secondary purposes. So, um, what else do we have here? Moving to check. 
I'd originally planned to move anyway, so this isn't a huge thing, but I was going to move to the United States because I figure you shouldn't spend your whole life living in a single country, certainly not in a single city. You know, you've only got one life and you spend it all in like 0.00001% of the planet. You know, traveling around and showing me that like the rest of the world is so different to what I'm used to. I need some variety. I need to experience it. Um, and Czech was simply a decision while well, Lucy's there. I was going to move anyway, so... It was funny when she, we were long distance, she was in Czech Republic and she was very nervous on a phone call or a Skype call that we had where we're still trying to decide whether she's going to come back to New Zealand, where we're going to continue this relationship or just leave it because it's too logistically complicated. And she very tentatively said like, how do you feel about maybe coming to Czech? You know, like her, she was hoping, but knew I'd say no kind of thing. It was would have been her dream come true and i made the decision in like six nanoseconds really that's how quickly i decided to uplift my whole life move to the other side of the world i was like yeah all right and it wasn't people pleasing it wasn't trying to keep her nothing i'd already committed to like i'll be true to my values even if i lose her it's just it was one of the most efficient value decisions i've ever made where there was no overthinking there's no debate. It was just my core values just went, that's the right move, go. And so I just went with it. And, uh, I mean, it didn't happen that quickly. It ended up being a fucking nightmare with immigration and shit, which I did not see coming. God, I fucking hate governments. Anyway. Uh, but overall, it was probably better for me in some aspects and worse than others. New Zealand's definitely a nicer country to live in and easier because of the language and because of my familiarity with the culture and so on. And it's got beaches and stuff that landlocked Czech doesn't have. Um, but there are pluses with Czech as well. My financial situation, for example, is fucking way better because everything costs half as much. The people here are more brutally honest, so you get much less people pleasing here, or you get a different style of people pleasing, which isn't as aggravating as the fake smile stuff. And uh, everybody pretending to be staunch, like you get in New Zealand. Uh, so it's kind of a more honest culture overall. And where I'm going in my life, and I want to be honest all the time, I really need to be around people that can handle confrontation and handle the truth. Uh, and you get that much more so here. You, you get no cancel culture shit here. <laughs> Nobody cares if you see something like outrageous here. They'll just be like, oh, that counts full of shit. And they'll just move on with their lives. They don't try and ruin you. Whereas New Zealand's already succumbing to that cancel culture thing that's spreading throughout the Western world. So I was quite happy to come here. And it's also because it's partly the sort of psychopath in me. There is nowhere where I really feel like home. You know, people talk about having that feeling like they go somewhere and they come back and they're coming back home. And they talk about like having to feel like they're at home or the sense of living in this one place in their life that's really them. I don't have that. Maybe it's because I've moved so many times in my life. Like I've been to like, I don't know, a dozen or more different flats in the in my 20s and I've really had no consistency there. So maybe that's why I'm like, yeah, nowhere is really home. And I, I feel like I've been in like four different places here in Czech already, you know, and I don't feel like any of them are really home. I wonder if I'll feel that way when we have a house, actually, when we make our own thing from the beginning. But basically, because I've traveled a lot and so on, I don't feel attached to locations. So it doesn't really matter to me if I live here or there or anywhere. As long as I can do what I want and be who I am, the location really isn't that relevant. Plus, again, the psychopath in me, I'm not that attached to people. <laughs> what I mean is I love people. I can love people and have great connections with them, but I don't need them to be near me. I don't miss people when they're away. I'll just create new connections or whatever. So... A lot of times when people say they need to be in an area, what they really mean is I need to be with my friends from high school or I need to be with my family. I don't have that. I can just travel back and see them. COVID's changed that a bit. I'm actually starting to slightly miss people now because COVID's dragged out um, so long here in Czech. They just, they fucked it up here and it's just been like locked down since it began. And, uh, and I can't go back to New Zealand where we usually go once a year for a couple of months. So I'm feeling that a bit. But aside from that, I'm good, pretty much. 
another big change for me is minimal socializing. I, I am basically quite antisocial these days. Uh, partly it's because my job is so social. I mean, I have deep, intimate discussions with people for a job. And you get to the weekend and you've had 10 of those in the week. You can't be fuck seeing anyone else again. I used to see hundreds of people a week and have no deep, intimate discussions. Whereas now, like every discussion I have is serious shit. So the idea of going through like the small talk of meeting someone new. So what do you do for I just can't even like imagine putting myself through that. I just cannot be bothered having a conversation with someone unless it's some real shit. And I'm like that. Like if I, uh, the other day I met someone new ish and within three minutes, I think we're probably three minutes. We're talking about the psychology of nice guy syndrome. And so I get along quite well with that dude, but if we can't get there, I don't mean we have to talk about topics like that all the time, but if we can't get to being real, if somebody starts doing the like fake thing that they do when they meet someone new, I don't hate them for it. I just got no tolerance for it. I was like, oh, I'm done. You're just another one of the sheep. Like, I just can't do this. I can't do another man conversation. Um, and, and my standards for the people I want in my life have really gone up over time i used to be like i love everyone and now i've just been more honest with myself i don't i do think a lot of people suck uh i don't think that they're permanently broken it's like a judgmental thing about their behavior but not about their personality like everybody's got the potential to be someone awesome even if it's not someone i like they can still be a great person but most people are fall way short of that potential and i can't be bothered having those people in my life I'm happy to let them exist, like live and let live kind of respect. But I don't want to be with someone if they aren't living with integrity, they aren't sort of trying to be a good person or whatever. It's just, I just don't need that in my life. So I'm really high standards kind of people. If I meet someone new, I'm like, you're going to have to impress me right out of the gate for me to even consider going further with this. You know, what the fuck is that noise now? All right, someone's decided to do some machinery outside, but I'm just going to keep going. Hopefully it doesn't come through too loud on the recording. Um, also, like, I've been working for the last 10 years on caring less and less what people think about me. on developing the psychology and the beliefs around that. I've gotten to a point now where, like, it actually bothers <laughs> Lucy how little I care like we'll meet someone I won't even say hello because I just can't be bothered using that much breath when I don't really want to and it's not real I don't feel like saying hello I go out I, I dress this t-shirt is like 10 years old and this is a regular rotation and I'm wearing track pants I always do um I don't dress for anyone anymore like my wife will force me to dress I feel like a seven year old like you gotta dress up nice you know and I just feel all right, but I I would I could see myself gradually, <laughs> gradually like going down to robes. You know how you see all these monks and all these so-called wise people, and they always wear robes. It's because they don't care anymore, and it's comfortable. And I'm like, you know what? I could really robe it up. Like, I think if I wasn't with Lucy, I'd be in robes already, with a beard down to my waist. You know, I'd just have zero, zero maintenance like physical appearance um but once here once this is kind of one of the risks i guess i think it's worth mentioning when it comes to working on your people pleasing is once you really take away all people pleasing agenda where there's no effort made to impress anyone or make them like you or make them think anything in particular you're not trying to make anyone anything there's very little effort left there's really little reason to do anything with someone unless you genuinely spontaneously want to be like i like the person if i don't feel that that's I, like i said i can barely even say hello i got like no motivation to interact it's like i wouldn't go and touch every tree to see how the bark feels i don't want to well it's the same reason i don't want to talk to every person as i look at them i'm just like that's just another primate walking past there's I've got no motivation to interact here, especially when 
the social time I do have, say my coaching clients, my time with Lucy and Chloe is so rich and so meaningful and so deep. I'm like, why would I do any superficial stuff? Like I'm full already. I've had enough of anything, you know. So that's where I'm at socializing. So I'm actually quite an antisocial person, which is ironic considering I still coach people a lot with friends and, uh, you know, creating friendships and connections, dating relationships. Um, but I'm very much focused on how do I get them to find great quality people in their life, not how do I get quantity and, and approval and popularity. Yeah, I hope you can't hear that machine in the background. It's pretty fucking loud. I might, you know, in the edit, I might be able to remove some of that background noise. But one example, I just can't be fucked, you know. I'm just going to keep going. Don't want to lose my train of thought, my momentum. Okay, a couple more to do. Changing my eating. It's a very quick one. Uh, I basically, it's, it's the same with looking at that Bron, uh, Bonnie Weir's work around regrets of the dying. One of the top five regrets is people not taking care of their body properly. And again, I was like, do I want to be that person who's, you know, like my dad, he was still pretty healthy and had a heart attack in his 50s. Like, do I want to die in my 50s? <laughs> you know, do I want to leave my family behind? My 50s are close. I'm almost 40, so my 50s are right around the fucking corner. My kid will still be like a teenager if I died in my 50s. So, also, it wasn't just about that. It was about overall the function of my body, like being a father, doing this work that I do. This machine is what I need to keep working well, and if I put the wrong petrol in it and I don't fucking maintain the working parts properly, then I'm not going to be able to do that work or be that kind of dad. So I got to this point, a very practical thing, where before I eat something, I ask myself, is this self-respect? Does this contribute to the big picture of you being a great dad? If the answer is no, I might still eat it anyway and feel guilty. But a lot of the time I just go, okay, you know what, I'll go have some crackers or something instead because flavor is good, but I don't need to have it all the time. I can have good, nice restaurant meals once a week or something and go hard. The rest of the day just eat good healthy food so anyway that's what i've changed financially so i'd say i'm financially sound at this point which means not just that i have enough money and good income but more so i know how to manage money in such a way that even if that changes i'm going to be okay i'll always be able to adapt and survive to provide resources for me and my family because i see I've, I studied money for two years and came to see it for what it really is, which is just a symbol of being resourceful and adaptable. And so it's not really about the cash in your bank account. I mean, you can give someone a million dollars and, you know, you can see it with lottery winners all the time. They get a massive payout. Two years later, they're worse off financially than before they won lottery because it's not really about money. It's not really about, A lot of you will think your financial problems will be solved with more money but it's not because they're not financial problems. They're mental problems and money can't solve that for you. You solve the mental problems. You won't even need more cash. You know, like for example, if you can be minimalistic and not need external stimulation all the time, you'll spend less. Right? It's just a small example of one of the many things that had to change for me. But essentially studying money for two years, you know, learning from the experts and money management like Ramit Sethi or Ray Dalio uh, eventually I came to understand how money works and what I'm really doing. And I started applying stuff practically. I even created a whole course on it that you can get on Udemy. I reduced my spending. I increased my coaching prices. I just got my shit together and started doing long-term uh, planning and action, investing, saving, putting money into different accounts and keeping careful track, having difficult conversations with Lucy around the budget and sharing money until eventually they weren't difficult conversations anymore. They were kind of fun conversations. And now we got our shit sorted. I'm very glad that I, I think it would have been better to do it 20 years ago, but like the saying goes, you know, Chinese proverb, best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. And that was one of the main things for me is to stop saying, well, I haven't done it well. Now it's too late. I'm just saying, well, start now then. So I started now, you know, and things are going pretty fucking well. I'm real glad with that. That's just one, and again, that's one less thing to think about. 
more bandwidth. So now I don't have to worry about dating. I don't have to worry about finances. And if I get my eating shit together, I won't have to worry about health either. You imagine the amount of creativity. You, you see how much content and shit I put out now. Imagine how much more I can do if I don't have to think about that sort of stuff. So the last point, which I saved to last because I think it's the most important one. And the symbolic of the biggest shifts for me, beliefs wise. I'm not ambitious anymore. I used to value ambition. My first book, The Legendary Life, talks about how to become more ambitious, ironically. But I had big dreams and strong motivation to make them come true. And I don't think they're unrealistic. If I'd stayed ambitious, they would have come true. You know, to become like, I don't know, the next Jordan Peterson or something close to that to become a big deal. TED Talks and popularity and reputation and impact and so on. All the stuff, wealth, all the stuff I thought I wanted. I was very, very driven. And then I got into Stoicism. And there's one particular element of Stoicism that came through to me quite clearly. You know, Stoics focus a lot on death. They talk about dying well, and they just talk about uh, how once you're done, you're done. And Marcus Aurelius in particular, who was the emperor of Rome, he doesn't get much more ambitious than that. He, I guess there's more luck than anything that he became that, but being the emperor of the world is pretty much the pinnacle, isn't it? And he was saying eventually my name will be forgotten the people who remember me they'll die and be forgotten the monuments will come down and crumble to dust he didn't realize that actually he was going to be remembered for quite some time but in his mind he was like this is all temporary it doesn't last nothing lasts even before really science was a thing they understood entropy they understood that on a long enough timeline everything goes to zero and I started thinking about this a lot. I was like, even if I'm the most famous, high-impact person the world's ever known, and that's unlikely, eventually the human race goes extinct. On a long enough timeline, we die, the sun goes out, something, disease. So the idea of sort of leaving a mark, of being immortal, of having an impact, why? I started to ask myself, why do I want that? When it's ultimately temporary what's the, what's the point and even like the idea of changing the world like making the world a better place making people better for what purpose they still go extinct in the end anyway right even if everyone got their shit together and stopped ruining the climate and stopped trafficking children for sex slavery and stopped all the shit that we do we still go extinct and we'll still suffer there's very little i can do about that if anything at all, really. Even Marcus Aurelius, like the emperor of the world, promoting the most, probably the most powerfully helpful philosophy ever, Stoicism, still, like, if you look at today, there's not that many Stoics. Like, he didn't do that much. Didn't have a huge impact. Right? Just a little one. And I started to think, you know what? My need to leave a mark, to have an impact, that's... That's ego. It's insecurity. It's me desperately trying to prove that I mean something, that I fucking matter. It was a fear of death that was driving that more than anything else. This urgency is what drove me to do 90 hour weeks. I'm like, I've got to get this done. If there's some mission, some purpose I had to fulfill. And I thought, well, what if I change the meaning of purpose to some sort of destiny from some sort of destination to arrive at like mission complete through to living in a certain way moment by moment to be purposeful and meaningful constantly now with no future in mind like if it all comes to an end anyway if it's all temporary anyway well what's the best version of temporary well it's moment by moment isn't it it's doing it right in this moment even if the next moment isn't guaranteed and a lot of the philosophies, a lot of different philosophies, harp on about this point. And I came to realize, I'm like, well, what gives me real sense of meaning and purpose? And it's really just sitting down with one person 
and helping them improve their quality of life. That's it. Whether they go on to have an impact on the world, whether I'm remembered, and it just it doesn't matter. And I started to it started to change things. Like when I create a video now, it's not like oh I hope this goes out to millions of people and goes viral. I'm like no, I hope it helps the one person that I'm making this video for. And if other people are helped out helped by it, great, good for them. And if some of them want to become my clients, even better. But ultimately, I'm just making this one video for this one person, and and that person actually is me. Because expressing myself is what really feels meaningful. Like right now, you're watching this as if we're having some sort of interaction, but I'm just sitting alone in a room, talking to a laptop, trying to focus on looking at the camera so it doesn't look bizarre when the video comes out. But it's just me talking. I'm just express. I'm essentially talking to myself. And it feels very meaningful. It feels like I'm doing the right thing with my life right now. Who knows? Maybe my computer will crash. And this recording will be lost. Doesn't matter. It doesn't fucking matter. I've got backups anyway. But this is what I've come to realize is, you know what I really came to realize is, essentially I have a religion. I always thought of myself as an atheist, and I still do, because the term atheist means without God, and I do not believe in a God. But maybe I am religious, because I've developed such an affinity for honesty and integrity that it really fits into the category of worship. I worship honesty. I'm obsessed with it. I pray to it. I let it guide my decisions. I feel like I'm a servant of it. Like I don't feel like it's Daniel deciding what to do. I feel like it's my values deciding what Daniel will do. And the values are beyond me they're in my subconscious i have no control over them i just do what they say so i've become like a slave to myself when it comes to integrity i do what my values tell me to do or at least i try to interpret them which is very much religion isn't it interpretation and then do what you feel like but you know honesty has become my religion and, and it demands a sacrifice of all neediness honesty honesty pure honesty means you give up on getting anything all outcomes sacrificed, good feelings sacrificed, people liking you sacrificed, or potentially, at least the potential for that sacrifice. It often goes better than you think it will, but you're prepared for it to go very, very badly, to have nothing but honesty, no other rewards. That's the level of like worship I'm getting to, probably arrived at. And that means wanting to have an impact sacrificed, wanting to be remembered sacrificed, Keeping your shit safe enough that YouTube doesn't ban you, sacrificed. I still haven't been banned, but given cancel culture, that day's coming. And I've come to the point where I'm like, it's been proven to me, undoubtedly. This isn't even faith, this is empirical. So I guess it's not religion. That when I focus, when I give myself to honesty completely, my life goes better than any other approach. And it came to make me realize that like any type of strategy where I'm trying to make a future outcome happen compromises honesty. Whether it's going into a conversation, hoping that it will go a certain way through to like building my business in a way where I want to have this impact or be famous or get rich or whatever. All of that will eventually erode my honesty because I'll have to choose at times between being honest and the strategy. For example, saying what I really think versus saying what's safe for YouTube. It's only a matter of time before I hit that crossroads. I've hit that crossroads many times. Maybe their bots just didn't pick up on it yet, <laughs> you know, but they will. Uh, or Facebook or whatever. Like, I'm, I'm going to get banned off platforms eventually because I don't line up with whatever their narrative is, either now or in the future. But that's where I've come to is there is no strategy in honesty. It's just spontaneous. It's thoughtful and considered, but not strategic. The consideration I put into what I say is not to change somebody else, but to make sure I'm as accurate as possible. Right? To let go. Like, I've actually said no to thousands of dollars worth of coaching clients by being honest. I could have said something that would make them sign up, but instead I said the thing like, I've said to people like, actually, I think 
you know, with what I charge, it would be worse for you to work with me because of your finances. Where I could say, actually, you know, finances are just in your mind, blah, 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 all the other shit that coaches say where they try to convince you that offloading heaps of your cash is good for you somehow. You know, I don't do that. Plus, I want to be a present father and a husband more than I want to impress thousands of people in some mediocre way. Like, I'd rather have the time away from working on my mission to be a good dad than to have like, you know, like a fan base like Jordan Peterson where everyone worships him, you know. I don't want to be a guru. I don't want fucking people to think of me as anything other than a normal human being. I just want to help one one person at a time. That's it. So, that's what's changed for me since the first podcast, which was, I think, something about getting out of the friend zone. There's a lot of things that haven't changed. Like like I said, if I listen back to my old material, I don't hear much where I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound right. My philosophy has really just grown stronger and more nuanced, but hasn't really changed in structure because by the time I launched a podcast... I had already figured out like the recipe of how I'm supposed to be living. Essentially, the way I'm different now is just the compound effect of following that recipe. So the way I see it, if you if your philosophy is right, you will constantly change, and it'll always be for the better, right? That that would mean you've got a good working philosophy. Well, that's what my philosophy does to me. So while I'm changing all the time, my philosophy isn't changing. It's just my application of it is becoming more and more consistent and more powerful. And so it changes who I am. So I'm actually becoming even deeper ingrained and and better understanding what it is that I believe is wisdom. And so that's changed me significantly. And it's actually kind of nice to see that. Like, not just that my life's improved, which it has. It's kind of like this undeniable evidence that I'm on track. Like, everything's better externally about my life, my relationships, my health, my finances, my business. Everything is going well and it's not luck. You know, so the philosophy helps with getting stuff. But more importantly, I just like being who I am more and more. You know, like I look at myself as a father. I'm like, hey, I'm fucking smashing it. Like I am. I, there's no false modesty here. Fuck false modesty. I'm a good dad, you know. And it's because of the work that I put in to make sure that by the time I had a kid, I'm not fucking downloading issues onto them. I've got my shit together. And then um, got the time and space and freedom available to be there for her. And I'm not just disappearing, working 90 hours a week, and she's got no dad, but she's got money sort of thing. Um, I feel like I'm onto it. So that's where I'm at. Thank you guys for your loyalty and listening to the podcast. Um, as much as I don't care about having an impact on the world, I love that people enjoy the shit that I do. Like I said, I'd tell myself this stuff even if it wasn't recorded, but I do get some great pleasure. You know, there's I sometimes I look at the stats for the podcast and it actually tells me who's listened to how many episodes. And there's some of you who listen to like hundreds of them, you know? There's some people who listen to like hundreds of hours of me every year. That blows my mind and significantly inflates my ego to quite dangerous proportions. But mostly I just think, good, if that's helping someone that much, if their life really is so much better um, for listening to me rant about bullshit, then I will keep ranting about bullshit. I I can't pretend to myself that it's definitely valuable. If somebody else somehow turns it into something valuable, good, then I'll keep doing it. I'm not going to hold back out of some false shame. So for those of you who get a lot out of this podcast, awesome. Please keep doing what you can to turn my words into some behavior in your life that makes you feel better. And I'll just keep pumping this shit out because i got a lot to say. You have no idea. Tip of the iceberg. 200 episodes is like a smidgen of what I've got to say. Uh, Thank God there are some limits because I am quite fucking schizophrenic with ideas. Thank you, guys. I'll see you all next time.